Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, last Thursday's video, one of the things we showed was the national temperature ranks maps, and we saw how the northwestern part of the United States, the north central United States, and the Canadian prairies had one of their coldest Octobers on record. As we get into the month of November here, here's just looking at the last two weeks of temperature anomalies, and we know that after Halloween, when that cold air finally made its way to the Gulf Coast and East Coast, we've set up the central part of the United States to experience most of this last two weeks being much below average in temperatures. We did get some brief rebounds in here, but overall, because the flow in the Pacific had been split, it's been doing something a bit more like this. Those two pieces of the gesture, the northern branch and the southern branch, keep coming together in this area, allowing for the continual kind of, uh, you know, unleashing of colder air that keeps sneaking down through uh, the Canadian prairies into the central United States. It's about the only places that have been a bit warmer than average, Florida, parts of Arizona, and maybe a little bit of California seeing over this entire time period above average temperatures. But those same regions seem to have been dry as well. You can see here the western United States, some places not a single drop of rain so far in the month of November. But where things have kind of come together here in the eastern third of the United States, you can see much above average precipitation. So we put this all into the context of that flow pattern, and we want to know where that flow pattern is going. First of all, looking just at the last 72 hours, we had one uh, system kind of exit here early, uh, at the end of last week, I should say, early weekend, bringing some rain down here to the southeast. But really, it's been a relatively pleasant weekend for a lot of us. In fact, Saturday and Sunday saw the buildup of some warmer conditions in the central United States. But now what we see here is the position of the front bringing in some light snow in the overnight hours. In fact, this is where it was pretty early this morning, uh, about 340 in the morning here here stretching from parts of Nebraska, even getting over to Colorado, all the way through southern Michigan. And the progression of this front throughout the day is going to be on the leading edge of that colder air that you can see there, or the progression of that precipitation. And behind it, temperatures down in the single digits here. And this front is on the move. It will make its way all the way to the Gulf Coast and eventually to the East Coast as well, bringing in some bitterly cold air for this time of year. When I say bitterly cold, look at the temperature differences just in the last 24 hours here. Behind that front, after what was a pretty decent Sunday for a lot of folks in the midsection of the United States off to the north and east, we've now dropped off temperatures compared to yesterday at this time as much as 25 to 30 degrees over what they were again 24 hours ago. And you can really see that front lined up well right here. Behind it, very, very windy conditions in the south central plains, but we're feeding this thing with moisture out of the south and east, and it's overrunning that front and the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere, bringing in a pretty broad shield of precipitation that will carry along the orientation of that front toward the north and east and toward the Gulf Coast as well. Meanwhile, in the North Pacific, look at what we've got going on here. We've got three storm systems kind of lined up, and they're all tucked away into the Gulf of Alaska and into the Bering Sea here. And we Need to be seeing when we're going to be bringing in some meaningful precipitation to the western United States as well. So thinking about all this and putting it all together, this is what we've got in the near term. Because the pattern is still blocked up over the west, we have the air stagnation warnings that are still in place for Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. But a broad section here kind of painted in blue color, we're on the lookout for some winter weather. And in the pinks over there on the right, we're now talking about uh, the uh, winter storm warnings that are for that area. The cold air is on its way south. You can see here that uh, parts of Mississippi and Alabama already have their freeze watches and freeze warnings out. And as we talked about, extremely windy conditions in the south central plains today. So let's get right on in and take a look at what the National Digital Forecast Database is calling for in terms of snowfall. Coming from central Nebraska here in west central Nebraska, two to three inches of snow is anticipated. Then as you get over into the kind of eastern corner of Iowa, southern Wisconsin, getting into the northern half of Illinois, and Indiana, and Ohio, we have the potential in here for anywhere between one to five inches of snow. What will be interesting is that the lakes are still very warm and the air that's coming behind this is bitterly cold. So the lake effect snow process is going to crank up and you can see that here uh, some locations potentially picking up as much as 20 inches of snowfall. And as that front elongates and adds to the lake effect snow event that will be going on in parts of the, uh, you know, uh, up upstate part of New York getting into the 
you know, much further inland here um, in, in Vermont and in, in New Hampshire and Maine. We're talking about quite a bit of snow that we picked up in that area as well. So let's take a look at as it comes through here. And I'm going to pause this right about here and step you back through the day real quick because I want you to see this is about 6 a.m. Central Time squeezing through. Let's just go straight to uh, noon. And what we're going to watch here is a transition as that cold air undercuts the warmer air aloft here. We're going to have the kind of sandwiching effect where there's warm air aloft and cold air at the ground. So I'm anticipating from the basically north central Texas through Oklahoma, getting through southern Missouri, southern Illinois, right here along this boundary. Don't be surprised that the rain will switch over here to briefly to a freezing rain sleet event as the colder air works its way in on the backside and brings this snow in. You can see the snow uh, kind of pulling through right into this area such that by this afternoon we're now from basically stretching from southern Illinois through central Indiana and then getting up into southern Michigan and northern uh, Ohio and then that continues to progress in the overnight hours uh, on Monday so this is 8 p.m. Monday as we stretch this out to midnight I'm gonna stop it right here at midnight look at the lake effect snow all the air coming around this high pressure center like this, blown across those warm lakes, we have the potential to pick up a lot of moisture, really modify that boundary layer and produce a lot of snowfall here. Meanwhile, as this spreads through the northeast, we have a, uh, you know, it could be about a 12 hour snowfall event that spreads through that area and the potential there exists for quite a bit of snow to fall. And uh, by the time I get you out to 11 a.m. on Tuesday, the frontal boundary is sitting right there along the East Coast, and it'll be pushing through the Carolinas back into uh, parts of Georgia. Now, meanwhile, look in the Northwest. This is now Tuesday, 6 a.m. Central Time, so 4 a.m. out West, and look at what happens in the mid-morning. This is the first chance at bringing in some real precipitation into coastal Oregon, but mainly coastal Washington we've seen in a while. And some snow coming into the northern Rockies as this little shortwave sneaks down here into Montana, bringing the next round of precip. Now we're going to take a look in a few minutes at what that looks like in our European model. But the first thing I want to tell you is this. We're finally starting to see the Pacific jet stream get out of that high over low pattern. It is still blocked and jumbled up here. But overall, this is a, a much better outlook than what we saw in terms of that really stagnant pattern preventing the western United States from getting any precip. Now, certainly the jet stream quite fast in this area sitting on top of that front. But like I just said, the northwest sees some change coming. The southeast United States needs to watch this trough right here as it slowly meanders across Mexico, getting into the Gulf of Mexico and eventually over to Florida and into the southeast. We've got to talk about those two features next, okay? So European model, we've seen this right up to here. So let's just play this forward after the snow exits the northeast and all we're left with is kind of the lake effect snow here as the frontal boundary finally exits. You can see first round of snow, Tuesday afternoon and evening coming into the north, excuse me, first round of precip, some mostly rain here because it is still quite warm coming into the northwest. Now that shortwave sneaks through Montana and brings some light snow to the north central plains. This is Wednesday morning getting into Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday evening. Now at the same time that that comes through, we're gonna to have to watch two things, okay? First, the upper level shortwave is now moving over Mexico here. And as it does so, it gets into the Gulf of Mexico at this point and begins to use the contrast of the very cold air that's still sitting here and the very warm water that is over the Gulf of Mexico. And that is gonna to help to reduce pressure and as this low takes shape here over the Florida Panhandle, we get our next chance at some precipitation coming in here into the Pacific Northwest again. A lot of just coastal rainfall at this point. This is not yet one of those big atmospheric rivers that comes through and just gives everybody a big blast of precipitation. But as one low takes shape down here in the southeast, another is moving here into the northwest. And that seems to be the two areas getting the most precipitation. But don't count out, you know, interior parts of the northeast as well, getting more snowfall out of this next system that sweeps through at the end of the week too. And as this all takes shape, we can see that by next Saturday morning, getting into Sunday morning right here, Sunday morning. Uh, early midday and let's get into Sunday afternoon we have two systems one here and one here now let's take a look at the differences in the models between the two and then we'll look at total accumulated precipitation you see the bigger issue with that system that's going over the southeast first let's talk about that one is that the European model wants to keep a much deeper wave let's draw that in black 
much deeper wave here that's slower. It moves much slower, whereas the GFS wants to get this sucker off the coast very quickly. Those differences are really seen better in the surface pressure fields because the low here formed by the European model is much deeper, brings a lot more moisture around the back side of it, and you can see the difference here. Look in the southeast first. You see the precipitation from parts of basically uh, Alabama getting over here into parts of Virginia, a much greater precipitation amounts over the southeast compared to what the GFS says, which is much lighter. Now, the GFS is more progressive with that second wave that sneaks through here, not the first one, but the second one that comes through toward the end of the week. And it wants to pile up more snow in this area where the European model is not. It's You saw it. It's, it's not that uh, moist. There's not enough moisture in here to do this. So model differences, even over that over the next week are quite uh, quite stark about the only place they agree on is the pacific northwest overall the patterns very similar in the pacific northwest with just the gfs wanting to bring more snow into the northern rockies than the european does but coastal oregon and washington really getting some precip here they also agree california not getting anything yet this pattern has to completely shift for california to get that rain and it's not enough of a shift as we get out into week two to see that now, our model differences continue here. Look at the GFS ensemble bringing in wetter conditions into the Pacific Northwest. They want it wet here and wet there as well. The European keeping all that moisture here in British Columbia and Alaska drier in through this area. Where's the wetter conditions? Down here, where it's drying through here. Look, I mean, it's a pretty impressive model difference, and I think I know why they are so different. Now, Honestly, this is a bit baffling. Both models agree that we're going to go from this big PNA event, positive PNA event, back down toward normal. Now, what does that mean? Well, when the PNA, the Pacific North American pattern, is positive, there's a big ridge along the West Coast. We, we've seen that. We know that that's there. The European model says, all right, we're going to take this uh, you know, above average PNA and also bring it back down toward neutral, back down towards zero. They also agree about the East Pacific oscillation coming out of the basement back up here toward average. You can see that. So the models are advertising a similar pattern, but the differences are, are, are subtle. And I think they're more related to temperature than anything else. So let's talk about near-term temperature and then broader scale temperature differences that are driving these model differences, all right? So let's play this one out. This is going to go through our next nine days of low temperatures. So yes, cold early Monday in the north central part of the United States. But the expanse of that cold really advances by Tuesday morning getting almost all the way to the Gulf Coast at that point, such that by Wednesday it is there. This, in terms of the ex whole expanse of the U.S., uh, here in the lower 48 at least, this will probably be the greatest expanse of our colder air. We do see the colder air hanging on for Thursday morning and Friday morning, but beyond that, the pattern tends to kind of, you know, moderate just a little bit. This is Saturday morning's lows getting into Sunday and into Monday. So we need to see these differences and why they are occurring. And to do that, I'm going to step you up and look at the differences between the GFS ensemble on the left and the European ensemble on the right. Through the next uh, three to five days, very similar overall. I mean, the two models are just in lockstep. The only differences that are worth noting happen at the end of this week. This is Thursday morning, getting into Thursday afternoon and Thursday evening. At this point, the European model is favoring a much deeper wave developing here in the Gulf of Alaska. Now watch this. So this is now Friday morning, Friday evening, getting into Saturday morning. And the differences are the GFS wants to kick that short wave out. The European deeper hangs around longer. This is the major difference maker for the Southeast in terms of precipitation. Outside of that, just blur your eyes and look, the models are in really, really good agreement. But it's week two where things get a little bit hairy. So getting you out now to next Monday, uh, really this is Sunday night, getting into Monday morning, here it is. Looking very similar, but right here is where the pattern change becomes most noticeable. You see the GFS ensemble, has a much different look across the West United States. Remember how much wetter it was? This is part of the reason. See the depth of this trough versus the upstream ridge? You see the Gia, uh, excuse me, the European model wants to break this wave like this and not allow for much more precipitation to come into the West United States. So the GFS, more aggressive, more progressive pattern, the European much more blocked over the Pacific and therefore slower in moving these systems through. So that is a major difference right there. Wednesday, the 20th, the GFS bringing a lot of precipitation into the Northwest, the European, not so much. This high over low pattern, very stagnant and dry. 
And as we even get out farther than that, look at what the models want to do by the time we get, this is now the 24th and 25th of the month. Uh, a completely different look here in terms of the progression of this pattern. I mean, you can see it. It's clear as day. The GFS favoring a trough in the Gulf of Alaska, whereas the uh, European over there on the right doesn't have that at all. And look at the difference with the building of the heights here versus what we've got over here in the GFS. Two entirely different scenarios. I think I know the reason why they're struggling. Like I said, it's a temperature problem. This is looking at the next five days, almost in lockstep with the temperature patterns here. Day six through 10, still some good agreement here with wetter, excuse me, warmer than normal weather across the western half of the United States with the cold still sticking around in the east. But here's the big difference. See the cooler air in the GFS that's not there in the European? I think I see where the problem is here. You see, with that big Siberian high that built in last week, we are now seeing the influence of it disrupting the polar vortex. And if the polar vortex is slowed down, if the polar vortex is split, stretched, if it's not just sitting, spinning tightly over the North Pole, somebody gets all the cold air. And the GFS is much more aggressive with that colder air extent than the European model is over on the right. And I believe that is changing the amplitude of the pattern as it comes across the Pacific and maybe possibly favoring colder weather here in parts of the north central Pacific, uh, north central part of the United States, whereas the European model isn't having it. It's maybe hanging on more to that pattern that's influenced by the really warm water in the Gulf of Alaska. So these are the differences, and they're quite stark here as we get out here toward the end of the third week uh, and toward Thanksgiving here. Honestly, that's how far out we are on the forecast. Quickly, at the end of this, let's take a look at South America. We're looking here at precipitation anomalies from the GFS left and the European model right. Certainly wetter than average through Mato Grosso, getting into parts of Mato Grosso del Sol. The models do have a little bit of a discrepancy as you sneak through this region and through here with the European being drier in that area. But very similar pattern over parts of uh, Parana and then getting into parts of Argentina. What's important to do with this wet forecast for Brazil is to put it into context. So this is the last 30 days of precipitation on the left. And we have the departure from normal in terms of percent of average, I should say, over here on the right. You can see the drier regions. And overall, if we just summarize this, looking back over the last 60 days, the drier conditions in September and early October here got us off our normal accumulation rate in terms of precipitation. But as of late, we've kind of matched the slope of that line there. And as a consequence, we've seen much more precipitation uh, you know, coming in in the last uh, you know, several days here uh, as we finished October and begin November. So this is mainly going to be a problem with just continuing to delay the planting of, of soybeans, which is not going to impact the soybean crop that much as it's going to impact the safrina crop, that second crop coming in. So we'll keep a close eye on it and keep you updated uh, each day this week. Hope you have a great week and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you.